what kind of a um, scheme brought uh, Alexia to, to us. Um, so you know that we um, created um, within months of the full-scale invasion, a program for in um, residents in Paris of uh, specifically tailored to Ukrainian artists and writers. And uh, we ran it uh, in collaboration with the Global Center in Paris for a year, for four people, and it was great, and we wanted to continue. Uh, and so last year, uh, we ran into a number of obstacles. Um, and in order to be able to still host a Ukrainian writer, um, I pulled some of my contacts in Vienna. And after months of negotiations, uh, we managed to create a residency for one writer in Vienna in a partnership with the Austrian Society, Society for Literature and uh, the Institute for Human Sciences there. And uh, we had an unusually big poll of applicants. And our winner is Alessia uh, with her wonderful project. So uh, we are sorry that she can be here with us only for a day. Uh, but uh, please enjoy uh, the conversation and buy the book. Uh, and if you haven't read her work, do that. So, uh, thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Valentina. I will just introduce uh, Alessa, her speaker, and then uh, she'll give her presentation, and then we'll get a chance to ask questions and uh, have our discussion. Um, Alessa Yeramchuk is a Ukrainian author and journalist focusing on the topic of cultural and national identity and the frontier. Yeramchuk has served as the editor-in-chief of the Choven Publishing House, a Ukrainian publishing house specializing in reportage and documentary literature, and has contributed as a journalist to various publications both in Ukraine and abroad. She is a winner of the Samovedets Literary Reportage Award and the Lit Accent of the Year Award, both in Ukraine, as well as a finalist of the Adami Media Prize and the Lviv UNESCO City of Literature Award. She's a member of PEN Ukraine and the Coalition for Pluralistic Public Discourse. She has been named the spring 2024 Harriman resident at the Austrian Society for Literature in partnership with the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and Austria. And the title of today's uh, presentation is Our Other Stories of Ukrainian Diversity. Welcome on us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, all support and actually for, for the opportunity to present my work here. It's really valuable for me. Maybe um, I just wanted like to share the story how, about my project in general. And uh, I will also tell about uh, stories of national communities uh, at risk now. For example, about Greeks of Mariupol, uh, Mishetan Turks, near Bakhmut, and so on. Uh, if I make mistakes, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, the background story. Um, the story of this project is connected with my personal story because I was born in Lviv, in the western part of Ukraine, near the Polish border. And I grew up uh, in a house where people of different nationalities lived. lived. And when I became a journalist, hi, um, I decided to explore uh, more this picture of cultural diversity because uh, this seared in my mind. And the incentive uh, of uh, like to start this project was actually the, the revolution in 2013, uh, which we call Euromaidan or a Revolution of Dignity. At that time, I was uh, working as a journalist uh, in the daily newspaper The Day and actually participated in the in this peaceful protest uh, during the during the revolution. And let me remind you what happened next, because uh, the hundreds of people died during this revolution. 
uh, in the fight against our authoritarian president Yanukovych and for our European choice and democracy. And we have perpetuated them as a heavenly hundred. And it's worth to note that the first uh, protesters who died were Armenian Serhiy Nihoyan and uh, Belarusian uh, Mikhail Zhiznevsky. And uh, in the aftermath uh, of the revolution, there was an outbreak of different uh, reforms, projects, uh, grassroots initiatives, and so on. So um, the online magazine, The Ukrainians, is one of, was one of them. And when an editor-in-chief uh, invited uh, me to create a media project, I didn't hesitate for long. Uh, I decided uh, it's a like, defining moment to start this project about national minorities, to, uh, to explore more, to comprehend our diversity more. And um, since the topic of national uh, minorities uh, was not very represented in our media space, so I decided to start this conversation. But I should add that it's like uh, it's only the start of conversation. It doesn't mean that this book or my uh, media project gives like uh, the a whole like uh, comprehend, uh, uh, information, yeah, compre comprehensive information. And uh, surprisingly, the feedback to this text uh, surpassed my expectations because, you know, at the beginning it was uh, like um, uh, insanity because I had no financial support. Mm -hmm. I only like the desire to travel, to explain more, to tell, uh, like to tell more about diversity, to uh, travel across Ukraine. But it was really a valuable experience for me, you know, because I spent three years traveling across Ukraine and um, collecting uh, information for my texts. And uh, during this time, I covered approximately 11,000 kilometers uh, to visit small uh, settlements and towns in uh, Donetsk region, Bukovina, Carpetia, and so on. And... Um, I should add that Ukrainians mostly they're really frankly and uh, sincere and I could come to a distant village and uh, they, the, the, the door was often open for me and I have tried to immerse myself in this atmosphere of living like within uh, uh, of, uh, on the border of different um, identities to uh, perpetuate in the stories of national communities and to taste the dishes and to hear the national songs, for example, yes. And um, I should say that uh, but sometimes those interviews uh, could last uh, into the night. And apparently, apparently, I think it was also important for those people to tell their stories because uh, they're peculiar stories. Uh, so, so it was important for me to make them visible. So, and as a result, uh, sorry, I just forgot about, <laughs> about the presentation. Um, uh, as a result, I was able to talk uh, to representatives of 14 ethnic minorities. Uh, they're designated here on the map so you can see where those settlements are located. Uh, if there are stories about Czechs and Slovaks, Mesetian Turks, Swedes, Romanians, Hungarians, Roma, Jews, Liptaks, actually Slovaks, but they they identify uh, in the divisive sense as a Liptaks, Kakaus, Germans, Vlachs, Poles, Crimean Tatars and Armenians in Ukraine. So initially it was a media project. Uh, you already saw that, yeah. Uh, and then um, in 2018, um, the collection of 14 uh, reportage was published as a book. And um, in general terms, I could categorize the stories in this book into three parts uh, because some uh, people moved to the area Yeah, okay. Uh, because, um, for example, some people moved to the area of nowadays Ukraine during the time uh, times of Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, or uh, Russian, uh, Austro-Hungarian and Russian empires. Uh, for example, uh, Swabians, Schwabs, Schwabe, uh, Slovaks from Transcarpathia and Swedes uh, from the Kherson region. You know, it was really su surprisingly, uh, I didn't know that we have a Swedes uh, in, in Ukraine, yeah, or I'm setting Turks. Um, so others, uh, people 
became a small piece on the chessboard of ethnic unification during the Soviet era. The policy of colonization or indigenization uh, in the 1920s, which was explicitly conducive to regarding minorities, came come to an abrupt end and was followed by repressions and repression and deportations. Because uh, Stalin's idea was to destroy uh, the national identity of people, so people were expelled, deported, uh, resettled, like to mix uh, to mix identities. And uh, for example, uh, the Poles from the Zhitomir region and the Germans from the Donetsk, Donetsk region were expelled to Kazakhstan. Uh, the Ukrainians from western part of Ukraine were deported to Siberia as kulaks. For example, my grandmother uh, was also deported. Uh, the Greeks from Mariupol were repressed as a part of NKVD uh, Greek operation. NKVD is the Soviet Ministry of Interior, you know, yes, later known as um, KGB. Yeah. And um, more than 200,000 Crimean Tatars, uh, the indigenous inhabitants of Crimea, uh, were forcibly deported to Uzbekistan in 1944. So that's like a brief story. Yes, it's just a small list of the peoples who were forced to leave their homes. And the third category is those people who came to Ukraine uh, during the time of independence, of Ukrainian independence, because they chose this place uh, because of um, because there was housing and educational opportunities. And uh, in the foreword of the book, the Ukrainian poet Ostap Slavinsky refle reflected on the topic of our diversity, and if I may, uh, I would like to read a couple of sentences from this forward. Let's be honest. Do we know much about our Mesetian Turks, about our Swedes? Yet without this knowledge and noble endeavors to build a political Ukrainian nation will be merely futile gesticulation, a shot into the void. It's impossible to invite an author into a dialogue not knowing his or her name. So my purpose is, so to say, to enhance, to reinforce that knowledge about our diversity. But yeah, and actually, um, as I said, it was like, surprisingly, I uh, received a lot of feedback about this text and uh, the book was translated in, uh, into five languages. Also, you hear, you see here uh, the English translation. Uh, Hannah Lelif, she is now here, and Zenia Tompkins uh, together they, they translated in, into English language. They're also in German, in Italian, Slo uh, Slovak, and Greek uh, languages. And I would like what's important for me now, um, because you know, after the full scale invasion. Uh, in Ukraine, everything changed, and I should admit that this book is like a, a kind of memories, you know, because uh, this war, this world which I described, does not exist. And uh, I, I thought, what should I do uh, further? Because uh, everything was destroyed, all those settlements were destroyed, and I decided to document the stories of national communities at risk. And I'm sure that after the war, it will be also a new, a new like topic to also describe this uh, diversity after after the war, because ethnical landscape is uh, changing like every minute because uh, people are uh, they um, they should uh, they leave their homes and um, I would like to share a couple of stories. Um, um, for example, about um, certain Turks from the Bakhmut region, Greeks of Mariupol, Roma of Kachovka in the Kherson region, or the Jews of Kharkiv. Because, you know, uh, destroyed libraries, churches, and culture centers are just a small list of tangible objects that national communities in Ukraine have lost. And... Um, Yes, and after a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, this uh, topic requires a new approach. The Greeks of Mariupol. Uh, the first story which I would like to share is, uh, is a story about vicious attack uh, that Russian inflicted on the city of Mariupol in the Donetsk region. 
and its inhabitants because Mariupol suffered more destruction and losses than during all the years of World War II. 90% of the city's vital infrastructure is damaged and 22,000 people were killed. And in uh, 98, uh, uh, um, 2090, I wrote about the Greeks of uh, Mariupol and tried to find out how this Greek settlements came to be in Donetsk region, yeah? Because Greeks in Donetsk region, how how how, how they appeared there. Um, and according to the latest, light, latest census, 75,000 people in the Donetsk region identified themselves as Greek, as Greeks. And I should know that this, la, uh, this last census was uh, con conducted in 2001. So it's a little bit over, uh, it's over due work because the next one's supposed to be in uh, 2022, but for obvious reasons, it was not conducted. So to give you a certain notion about North Azovian Greeks, I also should explain that there are um, two groups of Greeks because uh, they we call them Rumeans and Urums, Rumei and Urume. And to put it way, it were simply Rumeans are Christians and Urums are Muslims. And uh, the Rumean Rumeans moved to the present day Donetsk region two and a half centuries ago when by order of Catherine the second day like the rest of the peninsula's Christians were resettled or deported from the Crimean Hanat to the lands of Russian Empire and you know uh, historians uh, still dispute whether it was deportation or resettlement so we don't I mean I, I, don't, I cannot um, make some statement on this on this point and so thus uh, settlements with the names inspired by the Tauroid past emerged on the coast of the Meltida, as the ancient Greeks called the Azov Sea, for example, Hersones, Yalta, Malayan Sol, Urzuf. And um, yes, it's, it's a story about the local history museum of Mariupol with its exhibits and the Meltida Cultural Center uh, they were damaged and looted, and the unique library of the Cultural Center of the Federation of Greek Societies in Mariupol was also destroyed, as well as a collection of paintings by Ukrainian artists of Greek origin. And the fate of the archival materials are uh, is unknown. But uh, what I tried to do, I tried to follow uh, the story of my interlocutors um, after the Russian uh, Russians ruthlessly destroyed the city. The local uh, women, uh, woman, uh, Greeks, um, Olympiada and Athena, Olympiada and Athena, Hajinovi, uh, because, you know, they heard rumbles of Russian tanks and the impending war and it horrors, but managed to escape from the beleaguered Mariupol under fire. And Afina Hajinova shared the, what she experienced in the interview and she said uh, what she said to me. Um, to collect water, uh, we went to the well under fire. When the gas supply was cut off, uh, we cooked on a fire near the house. And since we had no food supplies, we ate only porridge every day. When it became possible to leave, we packed our belongings in 10 minutes. When we got to Zaporizhia and had internet access, I saw the news and realized what was really happening. Because uh, on the beginning, she couldn't accept that. So she, they didn't know what, what is happening in Ukraine because they, have, they had no... Uh, uh, no connection, and uh, now uh, Afina is in Great Britain as a ref as a refugee. Um, the certain Turks of Donetsk region. Uh, one of the national communities in Ukraine that has suffered the most from the war is the Mesetian Turks of Donetsk region. Uh, they lived in the village of Asukivka near, near Bakhmut. This is a picture from uh, 2016 when I was there. And, um, you know, all uh, there, like then in 2016, the front line was approximately 40 kilometers from, from the Bakhmut. So they already knew what war doesn't mean. Um, so here you see uh, Jasim uh, Iskandarov. 
the head of the community of Masetian Turks in the village of Osukivka. And she actually, he actually, actually explained to me the complex history of their people. Uh, their parents were deported by Stalin uh, from the Mesheti region in Georgia in 1944 and after Fergana massacre in 1989, after riots broke, broke up between the Mesheti and Turks um, exiled in Uzbekistan and uh, exiled in Uzbekistan and the native Uzbeks, thousands of Mesheti and Turks fled into exile and around uh, 10,000 of them moved to Ukraine and found a new home uh, there. Um, as they held to the last and did not want to leave the Donetsk region, even when the war was looming, even when the front line were 40 kilometers from their home. But nevertheless, uh, after Russian incursion in 2022, due to the geographical location uh, of their settlement, which was annihilated, the Mesetian Turks had no other choice than leave, because you know what happened with Bakhmut, I guess. Uh, so. Actually, they have no place to come back. And uh, in our last conversation with uh, Jasim, uh, he told me that they are now uh, near Krivirich, I mean, in Ukraine, but still not uh, in their, uh, in the settlement. Uh, oh, yeah, because uh, when we talked, uh, he said to me, there is only one road left, and I will definitely leave the day after tomorrow. Um, and yeah, these pictures uh, are from uh, this village. So I suggest that it could be the house uh, of, of those people. Uh, Sweets of Harrison region. Uh, it's really important uh, in the context of in the in the context of nation, Ukraine's national minorities at risk to tell about Swedes uh, because um, before the full scale invasion, people from fourteen different minorities lived there, and uh, in the village of Zmivka, and one hundred it's one hundred kilometers from Kherson. And among them are Swedes, uh, descendants of those immigrants who arrived in the south of Ukraine in 18th century from the Dago Island on Catherine the uh, Second's request and sent to develop the terrains. The language spoken by Swedes is Old Swedish, so uh, which was um, since been uh, forgotten in their historic motherland. And this phenomenon intrigued even the king of Sweden, who visited Ukraine in 2008. And uh, unfortunately, I did not have a direct connection uh, to my interlocutors uh, who I met in 2018. But I did ask uh, the head of the village of Zmivka about what happened to the Swedish community and about unfolding situation. Um, the Swedish church in the village of Zmivka was damaged by shelling, including the roof and the bell tower. Well, actually, it's, yeah, it's here. Um, that uh, the Swedes mostly evacuated. Uh, the protagonist of my reportage, Maria, Ma Maria Malmas, fled to her daughter um, in Kahoka, so she's now under occupation. And um, it's like a story on the margins uh, because it's not about Swedes, but it's about this uh, this village. Uh, it's a story about um, the head of the village of Zmivka, Mykola Kurchak, who the family I stayed with. Uh, he was captivated and confined for uh, 24 days. I talked to his daughter while uh, the territory was still occupied by Russians, but they had a poor mobile connection. So I had the chance to talk uh, to, talk, uh, to them. And uh, she told me in detail about how the Russians came to his house and took him prisoner because he spoke Ukrainian. And I passed this records to the Minister of Reintegration of the Temporary Occupied Territories and they tried to free him. I don't know if, if if this worked or like some, something other. And after his return, I interviewed him and what she said, what she what, what she he uh, explained me like what what he experienced. Russians uh, took me to a room 
put me on an iron chair, put wires on my fingers and began to interrogate me. I answered that I did not have information about Azov or NATO uh, Ato soldiers, you know what Ato is, yeah? Uh, but uh, they did not believe me and gave me a dose of electricity. It didn't stop for two days and uh, there were several interrogations at night and six times during the day. I stayed on the chair all the time. I don't know how I survived, perhaps uh, thanks to my sport activities, uh, I was still holding on, but my whole body was in cramps. And later, uh, when I, when he had surgery, uh, I asked them how things were going. Uh, and uh, he answered, I'm going, I'm going to the village to urgently write reports on the damage uh, to the housing. 100 reports have been written now. There are about uh, 30 to 35 more. That's that's how things are with us. We are holding on strong. Uh, so unfortunately, the situation of Znivka uh, is also really dramatic and tragical. And you know, it's so it's such a nice place. When I was there, I thought it would be a great like touristic uh, destination to to explore this diversity and actually those buildings, uh, this river. It was so nice, and unfortunately, it's now uh, destroyed. And um, there are a lot of people who left Ukraine uh, after the full-scale inv invasion, but uh, it's uh, unfortunately we have no statistics about like uh, because they this the statistics says about Ukrainian uh, like Ukrainian citizens, but we cannot we don't know uh, if there are like Roma suites or something like that. But uh, still, I tried to also focus on the stories of people who moved. For example, uh, stories of Roma of Kah of Kahoka, uh, which moved to which fled to uh, Germany. Um, in the context of researching the lives of national uh, Ukraine's national minor minorities, I am currently recording new interviews related to the new ways of migration, and. Um, I should add that there are five, uh, 15 uh, Sabatnik groups of Roma in Ukraine. And in Kahovka, there are mainly two groups, Serbians, Serbitka Roma and Crimean Roma. The Crimean Roma profess Islam and uh, their language like that of the Crimean Tatars is of Turkish origin. And the Serbians are Orthodox and use their own Serbian uh, dialect. And I met uh, Janusz Panchenko. Uh, he is a Roma ethnographer and author of the books and the leader of the Romano Tan public organization. Before the war, uh, Janusz was uh, writing his dissertation, uh, documenting the memories of elderly Holocaust survivors, teaching at the school for Roma children and promoting education and uniting Roma in southern Ukraine. And even when Kohovka uh, was occupied, Janusz stayed in Kohovka for another six months, helping families in plight uh, in dire need for basic food. And uh, after a suspicious calls, and when the Russians broke into his organization, uh, Janusz realized it was time to leave. Uh, if I may, is it's not too boring. <laughs> I I would like to to read uh, an extract for one of uh, the new texts. Uh, it's like not perfect translation. It's my translation, but I hope you will understand like about uh, what it's uh, going. And okay. um, in November two thousand twenty-one, even before the Polsky invasion, Janusz was approached by an official of the pro-Russian self-proclaimed Donetsk People Republic, which is annexed annexed uh, by Russian Federation now. Um, the head of their Roma organization. How are you? We have decided that her son is, is Russia and we need people who will work with national minorities so that everyone goes to the referendum and votes. Uh, they incited people that there were Nazis uh, here and said uh, they wanted to go to Russia. And we already have a team in Kahoka, join us. Um, so they tried to entice, entice him. 
And Janusz took this words as a nonsense because uh, who is he to decide where Ukraine is and where Russia is? He replied that he was not interested in. And when Kaholka was already under occupation, the Roma from the terrorist uh, DPR, this republic, called again. You see, you didn't take me seriously and I told you it would happen. The interlocutors teased. Uh, he still needed people to incite, Rome, to incite the Roma and he repeated that the offer remained valid. I said that we had very different views on what was happening and that we would not find common ground either now or later. And uh, the man was silent. And then he repeated the amount that's are to be potentially paid. It's approximately 500, uh, 5,000 euros per month, which is like for Ukraine, it's really a huge amount. And replied, if you change your mind, let me know. You can always change your shoes. And uh, Janusz replied, you're from Donetsk. Maybe you have to change uh, your shoes too. And actually, uh, after this call, he left. Uh, he left Ukraine and he fled uh, to, through the filtration camp, uh, like a, a filtration camp through Crimea, Russia, and then uh, to, uh, through Lithuania to Europe. It's why it was a done uh, approximately seven or eight day uh, trip. And the last story which I would like to share is the story about the Jews of Kharkiv. Uh, according to the latest data, uh, 40,000 Jews lived in Kharkiv before the war. And my interlocutor Leonid Brodsky, a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust, was forced uh, to leave. Uh, the, his city was two bags containing only his most valuable documents. And... Um, I would like also read about, uh, like one uh, a couple of sentences about uh, from this new text. Who? Why? Leonid exclaims cheerfully and furrows his brows. Even if half of Ukraine is nationalist, as you claim, are they pointing guns at you? Are they shooting at you? Leonid and his wife lived in a ten-story building, and when the rocket started whistling. The alarm went off and the elevator was shut down so that people wouldn't get stuck. Leonid, uh, 85, and his wife ran down the stairs, nine floors, and then up. The basements are not adapt adapted and there are no bomb shelter. In the end, the couple decided to sit in the hallway and bathroom, saying it was safe. But the sounds of the explosions kept them awake. And when Leonid and Natalia went to the grocery store to get some food to stock up, the alarm started again. We sat on the floor like rabbits and moved on all fours on the ground. We heard explosions nearby because there was a military school near us. And when we decided to go out to run home, a rocket was flying overhead. Leonid's gestures seem to be slicing the air. Who are you to decide the fate uh, of an independent state? He shouts indignantly. We fought for so many years after the war to preserve the borders. No one is tempted to return Kaliningrad, are they? You are a demon of evil, Putin. You, who, gave, who gave you the right to destroy people's lives? My gray-haired interlocutor gets tired of the long conversation and puts his hands on his laps. Reflecting on the war, he compares Russia actions to national so socialism and says that humanity has learned nothing. Leonid didn't want to leave his hometown, but after two weeks under fire, the couple finally took a bag and went to the train station. Now, Leonid Borsky and his wife are temporarily living in Frankfurt in Germany. And like as a postscript on, on March uh, 2022, the monument of the Holocaust victims in the form of a menorah at the entrance uh, to the Trubetsky Yard near Kharkiv uh, was damaged uh, by Russian artil art artillery sh shelling. It was really impressive for me because, you know, his father died uh, as a soldier of uh, Soviet army. And actually, he believed, he believed so strong. He 
um, he uh, he made a lot for like uh, Soviet uh, Union, and after that, it was really hard for him to accept that the story changed in like this way. Uh, thank you for your orientation. It's like uh, the stories which I prepared, but I would like to to have a free conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we're going to open up the floor to questions. We have a sizable online audience as well, so please keep online. Uh, present your questions in the chat, and I'll be happy to uh, share them with Alessia. So if anybody has a... Uh -huh. anybody? Uh, uh, as, I, as far as I know, you were born in Brunei, right? not in the shadow of the Soviet Union. And uh, I am the case of Soviet upbringing. And the moment they start talking about diversity in the Soviet Union, that was a way of saying, or justifying Russification. Like, oh, there are so many nations in Ukraine. Ukraine is a, is a country of a hundred nations and Russian language is the natural language of international communication. So I, my question to you is, uh, do you realize this Soviet her narrative heritage? Because as, as recently as 2012, we had been hosted the mayor of Kiev here, mm -hmm. uh, Klitschko. Mm -hmm. And the first question posed to him was, what is your stance on the language issue? Mm -hmm. And he started answering the question exactly like this, defending Russian language, mm -hmm. until his own advisor approached him and gave him a note and he said, well, I support Ukrainian language. <laughs> so how do you, do you, uh, are you aware of this Soviet narrative heritage? And if so, is there a way you try to frame the wonderful things that you are doing? I am absolutely amazed at your work and thank you very much for it. How uh, do you, if, if you at all try to frame it in a Ukrainian decolonizing kind of way. You can talk about diversity, but not with the implication of perpetuating Russian language presence in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think That's I will funny. try to in English. Uh, so uh, what I'm doing, um, it's I'm trying to uh, show the stories, like personal stories. Yeah, I uh, I, ha I have interviews with concrete people and I try to tell their stories. And in those stories, everything is explained. For example, uh, Greeks of Mariupol, yes, because uh, you, were, you, were, uh, you, were, you were asking about uh, Russification, yes? Of course, there was Russification. I, um, maybe uh, we don't remember, the, but there was Emskiukas uh, and Valuyev Circular. Yeah, I don't know how to translate it uh, into English, but uh, they're like the laws who prohibited you, uh, to use Ukrainian language in public space to publish book in Ukrainian and so on. But it was not only about Ukrainian language, but uh, about all other languages. For example, Greeks of Mariupol, my interlocutor, uh, like the woman who uh, who, I inter who I interviewed in Mariupol, uh, she uh, told me when she was a child, Olympiada Hadrinova, uh, the teachers were beating them uh, when they used uh, Greek language. And not only them, for example, Poles or uh, Germans in general, or I don't know, my grandmother, yes, uh, or my mother who should, spe uh, should speak uh, Russian because there was no other choice. In the Soviet Union, as I explained uh, uh, at the beginning, um, it was this uh, um, politic of Gornizatia at the beginning, but after, uh, it was like a myth, I would say. So they tried to do a little bit and they, so they try to support uh, this uh, topic of national minorities, but then uh, mostly people were deported, resettled, repressed, and so on. If they not support uh, this Russian ideology, Soviet ideology, and so on, and uh, we should admit that yes, we have like half of Ukraine, uh, like a big part of Ukraine uh, speaks Russian. Yes, but maybe we should uh, like research more and more go more deeper why why they uh, why they speak Russian because 
uh, it was an era, like uh, Russian Empire and then Soviet Union, they should speak uh, Russian because uh, without knowing this language, they could not uh, uh, study in the university and uh, they ha they would have no opportunities in this country yet. And for example, um, I remember there is interest interesting story in Odessa region where um, you know, th three settlements are located. One settlement is a uh, village of Gagauzes. It's like uh, people with uh, Turkish uh, origin, but they are Orthodox. Uh, there are uh, Albanian settlement in Odessa region and Bulgarian uh, settlements. And uh, they all, they have all languages. And for example, Gagauzes, they use own language in this village, but they use uh, Russian language as a lingua franca, you know, as like to connect uh, uh, each other. And the same situation we have with uh, Romanians, for example, in Chernivtsi region, and uh, actually Hungarians as well, because uh, they learned uh, like Russian language as a second language or the foreign language. And after uh, Ukraine was independent, they tried to learn to to learn Ukrainian, but you know they speak now like kind of it's mixture of Ukrainian and Russian, so they tried to to use those languages. But we should admit that there are a lot of people uh, who use other languages, and that's okay. I mean, it's not the main point uh, now. I'm sure that uh, like our main point now is like to defend our democracy, to defend our state, and after that we can explore more and tell about this story of Russification and maybe, I don't know, organize uh, con conferences and talk about how, how could we like live further with this uh, diversity. But it's interesting but, uh, that after a full-scale invasion, a lot of people who previously spoke Russian, they uh, try to speak Ukrainian now. So they switched uh, into Ukrainian language. And I actually, I understand that. Because, uh, for example, I don't speak Russian because I grew up in the Western part, so I had no chance to use the language. Mm, but before the war, I could, like, I don't know, if I was in Europe, I could speak uh, in Russian, yes. But after uh, the full-scale invasion, it's like, it's totally unacceptable for me because Russian, Russian language for me now is... is it's like about violence, it's about death, it's about blood, it's about like uh, destinies of, uh, of my colleagues, of my relatives and so on. Uh, I had like kind of uh, uh, like such uh, this uh, experience when I learned German language and learned about uh, World uh, War II. Because, you know, because now Russian language, this, uh, this language has now a different um, accent, so to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you. The way you uh, set up your presentation today, you talked first about this wonderful book, and then uh, the rest of your talk was about how things have changed in the last two years or so. Uh, so my question is, it probably has two answers then. Uh, so we're talking about in the book. Um, for, for various uh, communities that you talk about, how important was it for some of them to have contact with the home country if it still existed like how 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 often was was there a lot of exchange was there support uh, organizational financial support with mm -hmm. um with that and i guess now uh that that become a place of refuge uh, mm -hmm. for some of these people yeah, that's true. That's true because mostly they have this connection to us if if they have a state, yes, because no, right, not, right. not a lot all of them. Right. Yeah. But for example, the Setian Turks, uh, they had support from the from Turkey, uh Greeks of Mariupol from uh Greek 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 and uh, Romanians, Hungarians, it's also obvious because they had a lot of financial support. And uh, when I presented this book in 2018 in Ukraine, I repeated it 100 times. We should give more support uh, to those minor uh, minorities because um, and on the margin, uh, we use now the word uh, uh, communities, not minorities, because in 2021 we had a discussion about that and we decided it's not uh, correct to tell uh, that those people are minorities because it's communities, because we all uh, create our uh, one society. 
And uh, I told a lot that uh, we should give them more uh, support because they don't uh, felt uh, like uh, they, there was not enough attention to them. They had uh, like the positive aspect is that ha they had uh, like freedom for everything. Yes, so they could use uh, their language. They had own cultural centers. Uh, they could also publish book in their languages and so on, but uh, like on on their own, yeah, without support. And I think it's our mistake because we did if we were we were really mm, not interested in this topic. I don't know why, but I, I see uh, that the situation is changing because we have an we have actually an institute of uh, ethnographical research uh, and also like ethnocultural policy and uh, in 2000 like couple uh, 2021 I guess or 22 uh, also one uh, like another um, organization this uh, work was devoted was devoted to work with uh, our uh, communities for example they're doing a lot for Crimean Tatars because they mostly like not mostly but a lot of Crimean Tatars left uh, Crimea and they live now in other uh, in other parts of Ukraine mm, so it's really important uh, to give them support uh, and yes they have support from this in other countries thank you mm -hmm. uh, any questions here yeah. Uh, Hi, um, I'm, thank you so much for this presentation. It's, um, it's fascinating. Um, I research um, civic engagement and uh, the the um, the ways in which ordinary citizens uh, are sustained in the war effort, and my broader research interests include protest and activism. And I'm interested in to what extent. Um, these communities are cohesive or have, you know, their own community organizations or, um, you know, community groups. And you mentioned the example of Yanush Machenko mm -hmm. from organizations. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, you know, to what extent these are, you know, quite cohesive communities of their own organizations or maybe. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, uh, there are a lot of communities uh, who are present in this uh, public and this. Uh, uh, public civic engagement. You mean NGOs and so on? Yeah, not only like NGOs or even just more informal community kind of councils or groups. I realize not everything is, you know. Yeah, groups. there are a lot. Uh, uh, the communities of Roma, they're really active. Actually, Goka Us organization and cultural center, Greeks, uh, Greek center, um, Romanian and Hungarian as well. And, um, you know, but there are a lot of people who were like just uh, civic uh, activists before the war, but now they uh, joined uh, the army. Yeah. yeah. For example, uh, two in interlocutors from this book, they are now uh, on the front line. There's a Slovak, uh, Volodymyr Mohacin, and uh, Gagauz Ivan Kapsamon. Yeah, I mean, this uh, civic, uh, civic activism transformed in like this way. And there are a lot of people of different uh, from different communities on the front line in in the army. For example, uh, um, there is a battalion regiment, what about? battalion or Bata regiment, yeah. battalion uh, of Nariman and um, Chili Nariman Chili It's uh, like Crimean uh, Tatar battalion. Uh, there are a lot of Hungarians. For example, uh, the most like uh, the, the famous. Uh, a person is Fedor Sandor uh, from uh, Transcarpathia. He actually he actually teaches at the Uzhorod University or Mukachevo, I don't remember. And uh, now he is on the front line and he teaches from the the uh, from the uh, trenches, trenches, yeah. trenches. Yeah. Uh, so Hungarians and uh, Crimean Tatars, as I said, and they all they also really present in uh, also on a political level uh, in the journalistic uh, sphere as well. For example, uh, Rustam, 
наш ефобат, ти не знаєте, наш міністр оборони Рустам Маєш. Омеров. Омеров, so you know, you know him. And, uh, for example, the editor-in-chief of, like, one of the um, main uh, media in Ukraine, Ukrainska Pravda, uh, she is also opinion to Tara Sibyl Musaeva. Um, so I would say that they are really present in our society. And if you want, I can like uh, share like more information related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question online, and then what is here? Uh, Christina Logvenyuk uh, says, "Do you see your research and work with these individual stories as a medium to unify international support for the Ukrainian war effort, as it brings the fate from public perception?" And if so, do you think, what do you think it could look like? I think yes, because you know, uh, the, those, people, the, those stories, uh, of uh, national communities at risk is like we uh, I can show the true the truth about what's happening there and uh, that it's not and like uh, I don't speak too general so to say I speak about concrete people and I know that we should help them so yes we need we need help uh, for that mm -hmm. and uh, it's also important to have um support like to defend this diversity and actually to defend this uh, uh, not not only democracy but the diversity as well because people of different nationalities they they are dying yeah and we don't know what is happening now on the occupied territories uh, because the stories which i knew is not very like uh, uh so they are tra tragic. These stories are tragical. So we should uh, save him, Sa save them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, question here, and then. Um, I sorry, sorry, at the beginning of the presentation, so I might have that, but I actually have two quick questions. So the first one, I just wanted to confirm that, like the, or I just asked that all of the people that you. You interviewed a teacher to define themselves as Ukrainian now, like they're, you know, they're expanding their identities. So, just mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. and then the second was, um, I saw in your bio that you wrote a dissertation about just the broth and his lawyer, mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to what extent, like, he was kind of a model for you in this project or. Yeah, I mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, it was a really interesting story because uh, this, uh, for, uh, like, um, uh, one important reportage from this book about is about Jews of Brode. Brode is in, in Lviv region. It was uh, previously a Jewish uh, shtetl and uh, Joseph was born there. And uh, I went to Broad to to like discover the story of Josef Roth's uh, story there. I visited this gymnasium when uh, where he uh, studied. I tried to find some uh, some information about that. And you know, I haven't found a lot about Josef Roth, <laughs> but I have found like other story, other story about this uh, Jewish Jewish community community there. And it's like kind of it's also kind of connection for me, of course. It's uh, it's a story about Josef Roth, and you know, and he wrote a lot of uh, national uh, minorities. Then, like on the beginning of the uh, of the twentieth century, he has a reportage about Kalisia, about Polish, uh, Germans, uh, Ukrainians, and so on about this uh, mixture uh, uh, mixture of cultures. So it's also really relevant till now. And he also wrote about reportage about uh, from the. Uh, um, he was a soldier uh, during the World War uh, One, and uh, he described this uh, story also in his reportage. So I should, yes, I I can say it was kind of inspiration for me. Yeah, and um, the second question is about how people identify themselves. Uh, you know, uh, every time when I interviewed them, I asked them, "How you 
uh, identify yourself? And mostly they answered, so I feel as a Ukrainian, but with Kakao's origin. I feel as a Ukrainian, but with Polish uh, origin. And, you know, it's really, um, uh, we, we should distinguish like two categories, I would say, because some people, they are so assimilated. So we couldn't, uh, we couldn't imagine that they have other nationalities. For example, Poles, they speak perfectly Ukrainian, like the, how they look, I, I couldn't, uh, uh, I, I, I couldn't imagine that they are Poles or Slovaks or like other nationalities, but there are other people they have, yeah, I think that uh, uh, they have this um, will, uh, willingness willingness uh, to show their identity more, for example, Crimean Tatars, they are Muslim, and uh, it's like they tried to uh, defend their language, to use uh, this language in a public space and so on. And for example, Kaka Uzus, you would you would also hear because it's other, it's it sounds uh, in different way. Um, so some people are really assimilated, and uh, they they would say about their nationality only if I ask them. And some people they identify themselves as a, like Ukrainian, Crimean Tatar, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have two questions, but they're a little far. Okay, I'll just ask it anyways. Uh, so my first question is about what we can do to restore these uh, ethnic minority communities after the war, after the victory, uh, in terms of both uh, physical reconstruction of these communities as well as supporting these communities' growth mm -hmm. um, and uh, independent free Ukraine. And then the second question is a bit more specific. Uh, it was sort of about I say is um, the wild field myth, as to say, this idea that Russian civilization came into the Latvians region, Donbass, and what was so-called so Novorossiya, and sort of created all of this civilization from the ground up, which of course is not true because you know there were Ukrainians already living there, there were Greek people living there, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, what can we do to sort of uh, combat these pro-Russian narratives that sort of, um, you know, paint Russia as not only the regular civilization to these regions, but also the protectors of minorities within these mm -hmm. regions? Because, you know, um, Russia often tries to paint itself as like the protector of not only the Russian-speaking uh, populations of Eastern Ukraine, but to lesser extent, like minority populations within these areas, which is obviously not the case, as we've seen from the evidence here, but... Um, what, what else can we do to combat this? Yeah, thank yes. you. Thank you for this question. You know, uh, when I hear about this uh, myth the, that they are defending Russian-speaking uh, people, so if they defend them, why they kill them? Uh, why they destroy uh, their homes? I mean, what kind of defending it is? Yes, it's like nonsense. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this like uh, this propaganda and this idea they believe are so strong in this propaganda that they think that that is true, but it's not true, you know. And they have problem. It's like unhinged from reality. It's it it has no connection to the reality. What they think, for example, I wrote a reportage about Mariupol about deported people from Mariupol. And uh, my interlocutor uh, shared her story how she was deported to Russia and then she fled uh, to Britannia and to Europe. And she has uh, relatives in Russia. And actually, she lived there a little bit. She has a Russian uh, SIM card and so on. So, and when she called to these uh, relatives, they didn't believe her. Uh, about what uh, was happening there. He, he, she experienced that, but they didn't believe. And actually, I have also this kind of uh, story in my family because I have an aunt in Polokta, uh, um, in Polokta. And uh, they just don't accept that. They think that they're defending us. From what they're defending us, I don't know. And um, so I cannot say what we can do with Russians who are so... Uh, so they are so strongly under this propaganda. I don't know, but in Europe, in America, in the Western world, we can, I don't know, look, uh, we can uh, like give more information 
about tourists, about Ukraine, about uh, nowadays Ukraine, what is happening on the front line and about our society. And um, I to, as I said, to tell the concrete stories. And not, uh, unfortunately, Russia, they invested so much money in this culture, diplomacy, I would say. I mean, this, uh, because for, uh, for decades, it, it worked uh, for decades. Like, uh, I remember when in Vienna, there was a huge exhibition uh, of Russian artists. And there was, for example, m like small monuments of Stalin and Mikola the uh, first. I mean, uh, Ukraine did not a lot for that. And uh, OK, that's uh, that's uh, really important that now the situation is changing. But it's not, uh, I couldn't say that uh, this uh, work is done. Yes, so we should tell more. And um, concerning uh, this, like, of uh, the topic of rebuilding, of course, we will need a lot of uh, resources to build those villages. And maybe it's like kind of uh, like the, ch the chance to rebuild it in a new way. I mean, to, to build, so they, they will have they will have those places when uh, where uh, they can return and uh, like to do it better than previously yes and uh, the first question was about I forgot well that was about the physical reconstruction and growth about the for these propaganda companies. so yeah, okay. yeah. 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 thank you mm -hmm. yeah I mean we talked about and you know, talking about after the war and you know it's kind of a very optimistic look at it, but another thing that, you know, this war has done, you know, people have started moving around. So mm -hmm. these communities, they might have been quite isolated. Mm -hmm. Do you think in some way that there will be more of a connection and knowledge about uh, about these communities because people are moving around Ukraine and, you know, those that stay in Ukraine, they're moved to a different region and bringing this, this mm -hmm. culture uh, to it so there'll be more of a connection where there wouldn't have been before mm -hmm. the war and even just talking about the trenches like you know you have soldiers possibly from some of these communities mm -hmm. serving or in an army uh, that maybe pe people are meeting that maybe would not have met mm -hmm. uh, have you noticed that anywhere in, in your work or just you know in just other stuff that people are writing about the war is there any connections being made now that were not being made uh, before the full full scale evasion by these minority groups. Mm -hmm. Connections, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I cannot say, but I know that some like uh, people from different um, nationalities they could they could serve in one battalion, for example, mm -hmm. and they have like this kind of connection. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we forgot uh, a little bit about like other problems and we forgot about our national identities like uh, to and to unify our ourselves like to to defend our territories and um unfortunately i cannot uh, give you like the like the comprehen uh, comprehensive uh answer because i don't know it's probably As, too early uh, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. any other questions uh Yes. Okay. I have a follow up to mm -hmm. one of my questions. Um, it's a bit more concrete about what to do to restore minority communities. I was wondering if there was any initiatives or projects in development either before the war or after, sorry, before the full scale invasion or after the start of the full scale invasion, um, mm -hmm. which um, aim at creating sort of either like an ethnographic park of some sorts or some sort of interactive museums or sort of tourist attractions, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, in some of these uh, communities. These mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that there, that there is a program now. I'm not sure that it's uh, ready. Uh, but I know that this institute is doing some projects and actually maybe it's like um, it's important to mention about this law on national uh, communities, uh, which was adopted in uh, like in December, like a couple of months ago. Maybe you have heard about that, maybe not. It was important for us, uh, for Ukraine to adopt this law, like uh, on the way to Euro integration. 
you know, because it, we we should we should uh, make this law more relevant. I would say because last uh, uh, amendments were made, I don't know, in ninety one <laughs> or something like that. And um, if you want, if we have time, do we have a little bit of time? Sure. I would like uh, to read what is written in this uh, law because. Uh, I can uh, say about rights and responsibilities. So uh, within the framework of this law, uh, and um, it's uh, the, the national minorities, they have, or communities, uh, they have right direct, oh, no, okay, it's prohibited, uh, direct or indirect discrimination against persons belonging to national minorities is prohibited. National minorities have the right to use the language of the national minority or community and education, in particular in the languages of national minorities. They have the right to participate in the formation and activities of public associations and peaceful assemblies. They have a right to freely store, use and disseminate information in the, in the language of their national minority, orally, in written or in any other way. They have the right to profess any religion or not to profess any. And they have the right to participate in elections and referendums to freely elect and be elected to state and local governments bodies. They have the right to free and unhindered use of the language of their national minority privately and publicly in oral or in written forms within the limits and not contrary to the law have the right to hold public events in the languages of their respective national minorities. Uh, they have the right to hold a culture, artistic inter entertainment or spectacular event in the language of a national minority. Uh, they have the right to duplicate announcement, posters and other information materials in the languages of national minorities. So, and so on. So there, there are a lot of uh, rights for them. And uh, the only thing is uh, that this law is not working for Russian minority five years after the war. Like, and after this five years, I, I think that uh, this uh, law will be like readopted, so to say. So I think it's kind of progress in our situation with national minorities. Uh, and um, I, I don't want like to say you something about which I don't know because I don't know about plan uh, how we build these national communities, but there are a lot of plans to rebuild Ukraine in general. For example, uh, in February I was in a village of Yahidna, it's uh, in Chernihiv Oblast, and uh, during the occupation the whole village was destroyed. I mean everything uh, like to the ground, and now. Uh, like this small village is uh, completely rebuilt. I mean, and I, I saw when I when I visited this village, I saw uh, like new houses, you know. And maybe uh, they will do it this way, so they will rebuild villages uh, physically, so those people can uh, come back. Mm -hmm. And like because yes, the problem is that mostly, for example, my interlocutors they have no place uh, to be there. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. We had a question here, yeah. Yeah, and I thought you said, I, I thought you were, you were a little thinking about just what I'm going to and like not saying much about his life there. It was really interesting. And I'm curious, I was the rookie of the show about the French. I'm curious to what extent there's interest on the part of know, Ukrainian. Ukrainian people, whatever, to, to sort of claim, I guess, something you're familiar with writers who aren't necessarily ethnically Ukrainian, didn't write in Ukraine, but hail from this now sort of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ukraine. Conversation might be happening or not in mm -hmm. Ukraine about about the right these writers, yeah. Yeah, whether they should be defined or like included more in like the the canon of literature. That's really you know, I I dream about museum uh of process of Joseph Roth in body. I dream about so we will have in the Hobbit not only festival of uh Bruno Schulz maybe like 
I don't know, some museum or art center or I don't know, writer, uh, the writer in residence program or something like that. I would love to hear such stories in Jutomer uh, region uh, in uh, Bertichiv, where uh, Joseph uh, Conrad, Joseph Conrad lived, and so on. Of course, we should do that. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of things to do. Um, but you know, uh, I don't want to like pretend to say, for example, that Stanislav Lem is Ukrainian also. He is not really Ukrainian. I mean, because uh, they there uh, was uh, there there was different times, yes, and. Um, it was also a question for me, should I call uh, Josef Roth Ukrainian after? Like, probably no, because uh, he has like Jew Jewish origin. He wrote uh, in German language. She went to Vienna to study there. And like he wrote uh, all uh, his uh, books in German languages. So, but it's not, uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't know about him more and like to research more the story of his Ukrainian uh, past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, especially as like Ukraine, like, is that, like the, uh, in part, like, I, the identification of these minority groups is moving more towards a civic definition of what it means to be Ukrainian, and that is not only happening in the present, but also happening a bit retrospectively in the past, which is to say, you know, we understand, of course, just Brock didn't live in a Ukrainian state, for sure, but he's worthy of including and thinking about when we think about, like, Ukrainian history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and actually, you know, Josef Roth, uh, he liked uh, Ukrainian songs, mm -hmm. and he even knew, because his mother, uh, like, uh, Svivala sang, uh, sang, sang. sang uh, those uh, songs to him, and he knew a couple of these Ukrainian songs, so, and he also had some reportages about Ukrainians in uh, Galicia, so, uh, thank you for your comment, <laughs> I think, uh, yes, it's important, I mean, uh, it's a pity for me, you know, for example, Franz Kafka, yes, uh, he is like uh, uh, the whole, uh, like uh, the main story uh, about Franz Kafka is in Prague, yeah, in Prague. And for example, in Vienna, I discovered that a couple of months ago, uh, this uh, Society of Literature in Vienna, they uh, created a room uh, dedicated to, uh, to Franz Kafka because he died uh, there. He was uh, there not so long. I mean, a couple of months or something like that, um, maybe a year. But still, they have uh, this like this place to commemorate them, and I think we should do the same, uh, like to put us uh, more in this international context. I would say so. We will not uh, be too close to. By the way, did you notice you've been living in in in, in Vienna and. Uh... You know, we know in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, you know, for part of Ukraine, Vienna was the capital, so a lot of Ukrainians went to study yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Is there any research on a part of the Austrians to study the Ukrainians mm -hmm. as, a, as an ethnic minority? Have you seen how, are there any people researching, uh, not just Ukrainians, but other uh, ethnic minorities in, in, in Austria uh, today, the way that you're doing now? Like, is there anybody colleagues that you have met while being there they were working on similar projects but from the Austrian uh, perspective. No, you mean not yeah. that, yes, yeah. yes, of course. For yeah. example, Karl Markus Kaus, it's an Austrian author and also a reporter. Uh, he wrote a great book, uh, I don't know how to call it in English, in German it's uh, Sterben der Europäer, in Ukrainian Znakomi Europejci. Znakomi Europejci? Znakomi, it's just Oh, uh, disappearing. Disappearing uh, Europeans. And he wrote a book about uh, minorities, uh, but not only in Austria, in in Europe, I would say. And uh, he like these a lot of books. He wrote a book about Roma in uh, Slava in Slovakia, mm -hmm. Slovakia, mm -hmm. and um, uh, about, for example, uh, also Germans in Odessa region. Uh, so he he's doing a great job. And actually, you know, because when I was uh, working in the publishing house, we translated uh, those books uh, into Ukrainian. So we also had some connection. And uh, he's a good uh, friend of mine. Uh, and actually, he hosted me on the beginning on the war in his atelier in, in Salzburg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think we have time for one more question. Uh -huh. uh, 
Rigo, can you speak of uh, any role that the minorities use against the communities used to study in Ukraine play in galvanizing uh, support from their respective historical uh, homelands, like the uh, Mariupol Greeks mm -hmm. from Greece, uh, Rom Romanians from Romania, Jews from Israel, and elsewhere to support Ukraine again in its war against Russian aggression. Have, have, they, have they tried to play any role in galvanizing that support across the border? Uh, if you know anything about that, if you know this very uh, as, as I know, like because there, there we have this international battleground. Uh, in Ukraine, so there are a lot of foreigners uh, who, who who is who are fighting for Ukraine. Uh, but maybe I uh, it's question it's a no zahalom. Це загалом треба мати на увазі чи саме про ті менш ніби представники не знаю меншини в інших країнах. For example, Greeks of Mariupol, they fled for, uh, at, the, at the beginning uh, to Greece. And Athena then, uh, so she fled to Great Britain because of some professional reasons, I guess. But uh, they had these demonstrations there in in Greece and uh, with Ukrainian flags and so on. So there, they show their uh, civic engagement uh, really strongly. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, if there's no more questions, I wanna. Uh, thank everyone for coming today and uh, thank uh, Leslie for a wonderful presentation and please come up and talk to her about these wonderful books that she has brought here today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not s